as I posted online, there's a, a sample midterm from last spring that I added, along with the study guide that's up there, uh, and then the lecture notes over here. And the way these are designed is I've got um, a bunch of slides that basically go through what I think are like the, the greatest hits of the first four units, just things that I think you should be thinking about as you're studying, and then I've got like several kind of practice problems. But these are just meant here to, to seed any sort of discussion. Given the stuff that's already out there, are there any questions you already have that you'd like me to answer? Yes? So I noticed on the one that you had given us from last break, there's uh -huh. some um, like free responses on there. Will those be on the actual midterm? No, so the midterm this semester is going to be all Scantron. <coughs> so you can imagine a similar level of the, the difficulty, but I will interrogate you in ways in which you have to answer via multiple choice. Now, I will sometimes make use of like, you know, select all or select a combination. So I might give you more than five answers. And so like the six, seven, eight answers will be combinations of letters. And so it wouldn't necessarily be just pick five choices every time. Maybe selecting none will actually be the right answer for some. So I try to come up with creative ways to uh, create a wide range of uh, questions on the kind of hierarchy of questions with a, a Scantron, but it'll all be a Scantron format. And I do that so that we can have a retake so that I can have, um, have the highest probability of getting your scores back to you before the retake. So any other questions that have come up? Yeah? Is the retake also a Scantron? That's right. It'll be, basically what I've done is, uh, so I've almost got the exam done, and once I'm done with it, I'm going to just uh, take those questions and create, so I'll create a version A and version B for the, the first exam. And I'll take those A and Bs and I'll just copy them onto the C and D and then go through every question. And then for every question, think about a question that I think is of similar difficulty to that question, but otherwise has a very similar format. So if, uh, so a lot of times when I do this retake thing, the first midterm you kind of do is like to kind of learn how to take the exam. And then the second midterm, the retake, will be in the exact same format, but a lot of different questions. But you shouldn't be surprised by the formatting thing. Or maybe in the first one, you might be a little surprised. Um, you've already seen a sample from last spring that, again, has three responses, so you know it's going to be a little bit different. Um, also, if it helps, um, I put a sample final exam from last spring. And the final exam is cumulative, and so the first like half of the final exam has questions from this part. So that might also be something to look at. Yeah. Well, I would say anything that I focus on in class, which has, which has included portions of the reading, is, is what you should sort of focus on. But that's, you know, things I've put in this uh, lecture, things that I've put in the study guides, I mean, I think those are things you sort of, I mean, so like Moorcroft, um, I provide the textbook as an auxiliary reference to provide you extra help. There will be uncertain sections of, of the chapters that I haven't really put a lot of focus on, and so you don't... I'm not going to like look for things that we haven't talked about in class that have been in the book and ask about them. So pretty much if you feel like it's been represented in class, that's it's fair game. Now you might not remember everything that's been represented in class, but hopefully through the lecture slides, through the study guides. Also, you may have, uh, in case you didn't notice, but I'll put them um, at the beginning of each one of these things, but at the beginning of every, every unit, I've got these learning outcomes on Canvas. And so like under unit A, the first link is learning outcomes, and it lists these are the things that I think you should come out of the class learning from that unit. So those are also good things that I would, you know, there's only four of these pages to go through. And just make sure on every bullet you feel like you have a good response to that bullet. So any other questions? Yeah. Great. Sure. I know that now is fair game. Unless there's any other administrative type questions or questions about format or timing or anything like that. All right, well then, so questions about the study guide. Let me see if I can, um, so pull up the study guide so I can walk, or yeah, maybe it'll be easy enough. So uh, what particular questions did you have? I'm paying attention, I'm just trying to pull it up myself. Um, I, I just, I wasn't sure how to apply what we're doing to questions that are Okay. And so I, I, I did it myself, but I don't think the answer's that fine. So I just wasn't sure where I was going on. 
Okay, so um, let me bring that one up there. So there's a there's a question so on the study guide about um, how to model population dynamics of certain types of populations. So if I uh, come up here. This was six, right? All right. So if um, so, I guess maybe it'll be easiest. Maybe I can pull up. I'll switch to looking at that one. It's not super readable. Let me see if I can flip the orientation. All right, that's not so bad. OK, so this question says, you have been tasked with modeling population dynamics of waterfowl that produce sexually. Um, so you have to, so this is, this is probably the most advanced version on the study guide, meant to kind of really stretch you. Um, I probably won't ask something quite this advanced on the midterm. But it's meant to sort of say that if you feel prepared to answer this one, you're going to be very comfortable with the mid modeling problems on a midterm. So the idea here is I have a number of males, M, and I have a number of females, F, and they encounter each other on R time units on average. And then they have a successful mating, P, probability of times, of which they produce offsprings half the time. Assuming the males have a lifespan of L, and are immediately able to mate after being born, which of the following expressions might represent the net inflow of males? So I'm looking for um, you know, males to come into the population. So um, I guess I could mark, let me see if I can, well, all right. Um, let me see if I can create a quick copy of this and then I can mark it up and then post the markup copy as well. Duplicate. All right. Okay, so six here. So when I looked at, so what I'm looking for is I basically imagine that there is some stock M and it's got some outflow and it's got some inflow coming into it. And um, I am interested in the net inflow, or the net, yeah, so basically the inflow minus outflow for this population. And so when I look down through these expressions, I can kind of do an elimination here, because I want to say that I know that males in the population, if I look up here, males, those are M, and I know they have a lifespan of L. So we see in bacterial models, how do we model outflows due to death? It's, uh, if I know every individual lives on average L time units, then what is the net outflow, or what is the outflow from the population due to death? Can you remember this? So the formula, so here I've got the, a number of individuals M, and they live for L time units on average. So what would this death outflow be? Right, it'd be M over L. So M is the population, L is their average life cycle. And so then I have to think about, like, well, then how many, you know, what is the inflow? How often are males born? Well, already here, if I look at this, I may not know what this formula is, but I can kind of see that I know that the net inflow going into this box is going to be um, the thing on the left here minus the thing on the right. So I would expect that I'm going to see probably a minus m over l. Well, I only see two that have a minus, or three that have a minus m over l, this one, this one, and this one. So I can probably eliminate this thing. So that's one thing, this part c, I probably can get rid of it. But then now I need to figure out the inflow expressions. And I could also probably use units to sort of say, well, I know like 
another reason I could have eliminated this one is I want this to be a rate. And this is like in, in uh, terms of individuals, and this is in time. Individuals times time is an array. Individuals divided by time is a rate. So I could probably do some other tricks to figure out what the right rates are. But let's just do the modeling problem. Well, the modeling problem says that there are m males that have to meet one of f females. And so that implies that there are m times f possible ways that could happen. So that probably means I need to see an m times f somewhere in the inflow. So somewhere in this inflow here, I'm going to have an m times f, which is the number of ways males can meet females. Now that event happens on average every r times. So we know that in the bacterial example, we said if the event of birth happened every w time units, on average, then I would have the number of bacteria that could give birth divided by W. Well, here I have the number of possible matings divided by how often they happen. So I know my inflow is going to have MF divided by R. But then it says that of all of those events that occur, those pairings that occur, only P are successful. And of those P, only half will be male. So that tells me that I need to take this rate, mf over r, and multiply it by <laughs> p to tell me which fraction are successful, and then divide that by 2 to tell me how many of those will be male. And so that's kind of the modeling approach I got, where I can get the inflow is the number of males times the number of females divided by how often that happens, times, given how often that happens, the probability that actually result in a mating. And then that cut in half because only half of those matings result in males. And that's my inflow to males. And then each one of those males lives on average for L time units. That's my outflow of males. So that's how I end up getting the expression this minus that. So I could put a little minus up here. And then that is exactly this, this one right here. And so that's how I got that one. And we could have also come up with ways of sort of you know, reasoning out why it's probably not through some of these others by units or by the information given. But that's sort of the full way of how I would come up with that expression. So this is a little more complicated. Again, we haven't done a sexual reproduction example for the, po for the population uh, dynamics. Uh, but I threw that in there in the study guide just to kind of stretch your thinking on this. Um, and that's where I got this. Are there questions about that? how we get these formulas. Number of events divided by how often they occur times fraction of those events that are significant. That's my inflow. And then number of um, individuals divided by how often they, they are removed from the population. That's my outflow. Anything else there? Anything else on the study guide? Yeah. Is that on the study guide? Uh -huh. That's on okay. Yeah, sure. And it's question number six, where you circle eight inappropriate answers. And uh -huh. I was just wondering if you could kind of go through and reason why some of them were incorrect. I know you had some of them, but a little few of them. All right, that was um, midterm B. Um, oh, but, but you mean the sample midterm B, gotcha. Yeah. So um, let's see. Trying to delicately do that, delicately do this without revealing anything I shouldn't. That's okay. We won't tell anyone. So we'll do duplicate. All right. So I'm sorry. Which question was that? Six. All right, so, um, so this is one that down here, there's a bunch of options. And so all of these are different models. Some are stock and flow diagrams. Some are differential equations. And then this is another one of these modeling problems where then up here, I say that uh, you basically join the Department of the Interior, and um, your employers tell you to incorporate the number of invasive fish into a model of, uh, of risks. You have to use the following parameters of the model, the average time a fish takes to produce offspring, 
the average lifetime of a fish. Uh, you find notes of a prior employee who worked on this problem, and um, her notes include 10 model systems. You decide that eight are not appropriate for the system, so then you have to figure out which ones are appropriate. So what we're looking for here is, uh, is so we've got these variables, P, which is my population, and then I've got uh, R, which is time to reproduce, and L, which is uh, average lifetime. And I would like to go down through here. <clears throat> and uh, uh, remove the ones that are clearly not models of this system. So it's like I find this employee's notes, and I notice that she has worked on this, that she's worked on other things. So what things are definitely this system, or at least could be this system. And so uh, I think what I end up saying here is that G is an option. And, uh, and I'm guessing I probably also said that um, maybe D, no. Um, yes, I'm guessing I said B and G are the right answers. Is that, is that right? Okay, so um, I am going to say that, I'll just mark those, and then we can talk about why. So these are the um, good model, and that's also a good model. And, all right, and so the question is, why are the other ones bad models? And so... I like models that show that P, the population, is a stock. So those are candidates. But the reason I don't like this one is that this is suggesting that the inflow only depends on the reproduction rate and not on the current number of fish. So because there is no causal link between P and R, then I know that this is saying there's like a constant flow rate that regardless of how many fish you are you're having, you're going to still have that same amount of, like every year you're going to get three fish. <clears throat> Down here, it's going to be like the first year you got three fish, the next year you might got nine fish, and the next year you might have 81 fish or something like that. But, so it can grow exponentially, but here it's always three fish, three fish, three fish. And so because there's no causal link going back, there's no way to put the population into the inflow, so that's not a good one. Likewise, this is suggesting the outflow rate does not depend on the current number of fish. And that just doesn't make sense to me, because the number of deaths should somehow relate to the number of fish. If there's a lot of fish, I get a lot of deaths. So if there's very few fish, I get very few deaths. Because there's no link there, then that suggests this is a bad model. So because of that, so I'd say maybe I could just write that no links. And so that is a bad one. Um, if I look here, this next one down here, this is effectively saying P is a stock, and this is the inflow going into that stock. And this is saying that there's births, so P divided by R, which I like, but there's no deaths. So, um, so this one here is um, no deaths. Um, this one down here says that the um, population affects the average lifetime and the average rate of reproduction. But I said those were constant, that regardless of what the population is, every individual lives for uh, this long and every individual takes this amount of time before reproduction. So that dependency is it's actually sort of reversed. It's more like the average lifetime uh, is somehow is, the population more depends on the lifetime <coughs> and the population depends on the reproduction time, not the other way around. So these are, um, uh, you know, I'd say wrong direction arrows. Uh, then, uh, like over here, this this one here, this um, is not a flow equation. So it's not the DPDT, but I want to see. It's just saying this is saying the population is equal to this. Not the change in population is equal to that. So that's, a, that's bad. <coughs> um, these are just, uh, this is, uh, you know, wrong 
formula, not a rate. And then similarly here, not a rate. And then also not a flow. And down at the bottom here, um, this here is the, this inflow depends on lifetime, which is the wrong, we want the inflow to depend on the reproduction rate. So, and likewise, the outflow depends on the wrong thing. So that tells me that that's wrong. And then this one here um, says that it has no, no inflow. It's only an outflow. So this one has no inflow. And I think that's all of them. So that's the reasoning that I would have for how I would say that this is, an, this is a reasonable model, this is a reasonable model. In fact, this stopping flow diagram is a reasonable approximation of this differential equation. So these are effectively identical. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about any of the study materials that you want to bring up to make sure we get out of the way before any of the other stuff that we have prepared? Yeah. Um, I guess one of the first questions I've been studying them, but uh, one of the possible responses, well, actually, like, um, for number two, to the best we can see. Ah, yes. Right, so causal loop diagrams are, are used to find loops, but they do not necessarily have to have loops. So I uh, have, I, I, basically I need to say, I know these six variables matter in my system, and I'm going to draw all the causal dependencies. After I draw all the causal dependencies, dependencies, I step back and I look for feedback loops. And then those feedback loops tell me about the dynamic nature of the system. But it might be that after I draw all of those, everybody feeds into one variable and there's no loops. So it's, it's still a causal loop diagram because it enables me to look for causal loops, but it doesn't necessarily have to have causal loops. So <coughs> if I need an, you know, an example, um, I could um, go back to scratch pad here. So, Change template. So, like as an example, um, I could say, well, you know, I, I think that the temperature uh, and the um, number of um, heat related deaths and the um, amount of rainfall may be related in some way. So I throw these things up, and then I go and do some research, and then let's say I find that there are causal links between these. And so maybe um, as you increase temperature, you increase the heat-related deaths, and maybe there's some uh, relationship between temperature and rainfall. And um, maybe you say as you get more rainfall, maybe they'll get a decrease in temperature. I don't know, something like that. And so I end up drawing these things, but it turns out that there's nothing that closes that. that. So I might put up you know, the pluses and minuses. And let's say with an increase in temperature, I get an increase in this. Maybe with an, incre amount, with an increase in rainfall, maybe I get a decrease in temperature. So I would still call this a causal loop diagram because it's showing me all the causal links. But now that I've drawn them all and I step back, I don't find any loops. So it's still a CLD because it allows me to look for loops, but this particular CLD doesn't have any loops in it. Does that make sense? So I, it could be that there, I find out that it turns out that there is some weird relationship like sacrifice to the gods that with the more heat-related deaths, you actually get more rainfall. So, um, you know, and so due to this kind of, you know, I'll call this a sacrifice loop, which goes this direction, um, then, you know, and that it would end up being a, a balancing loop, then 
then this sort of, you know, I'd say, ah, we know, well, if in the way, in my view of the world, if there is a relationship between the number of people that, uh, that die due to temperature and the amount of rain, in fact, the more people that die, the more rain I get, then that naturally, in my view of the world, is going to bring down the temperature and also bring down the number of deaths. And so in my view of the world, then actually there's some good in that all these people are dying from heat-related deaths because they end up increasing the rainfall, which is decreasing the temperature. So I have now revealed a balancing loop that I wasn't quite sure was there until I drew all of those links. But in reality, if that one last link wasn't there, if this is a spurious link and it doesn't actually exist, I still have a causal loop diagram, I just don't have any loops in it. Okay. Any other questions about the material? Yeah. Number 11, I'm going to turn B. Okay. Let's see. Midterm. All right, so midterm B, number 11. All right, yeah, so, um, so this one here, so I've got a stock and flow diagram, and I ask a couple questions. I say, like, uh, next to each of both F1 and F2 flows, so there's an F1 flow going into A, an F2 flow coming out of C, uh, write a corresponding flow formula that is consistent with the information given. And so I see here that, uh, so none of these links are annotated with positive or negative, but I at least see that there's links there. So F1, I can see that the flow going into A has access to information from A. And the flow coming out of C has access to information from B. So that tells me that I can write any formula I want for F1. It just has to make sure that it only uses A as a variable. And I can write any formula I want for F2, but it just has to make sure the only variables it uses are B. So there's a bunch of different answers here. Um, and so like for F2, I could write just simply B, or I could write B squared, or minus B, or, you know, we're five minus B. These are all options, but the key point is that they all only depend upon B. For F1, I could write lots of things as well. I just need to make sure that F1 only depends upon A. So F1, um, for example, could be equal to A, A squared, 5 minus A, et cetera. And so I'm able to, uh, all I was sort of saying here is I wanted to make sure that you could look at a causal loop diagram, or look at a stock and flow diagram with its links. And from the links, be able to tell what information you're allowed to use in the formulas. So then if I go down to some of the other questions there, like I say, next to F3, write a formula that ensures that F3 participates in a negative feedback loop. Well, if I look up at F3, which is uh, right here, then I see that F3 is the flow going into B. So F3 has a positive relationship with B that's kind of hidden here, but we know that there's a positive arrow going this way. And I know that F3 depends upon B. Well, this is basically saying that I, given that I know that there is an implied positive arrow going this way, and given that, uh, then I want to make sure that the relationship between B and F3 is also positive. And so I just need a formula. Let's say F3 is equal to B or B squared, but not something like negative B or 3 minus B because those would be uh, the opposite. Or even one divided by b, that would also be a bad one. So all of these x'd out formulas here show that there would be a negative relationship from b to the flow going into b. But in order for this to be a, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I screwed that up. So this is a negative feedback. And so these are the right ones, and these are the wrong ones. So my apologies. I, in my head, I thought I wrote positive feedback loop. <laughs> Ah, yeah, I see. Yes, thank you. So for this one, for the negative feedback loop, if I undo all of those, 
then I would say that these ones are the wrong ones. And instead, like minus b, 3 minus b, 1 over b, these are all. So these would be positive. Um, so I want a negative here. And in order for this to be negative, I need uh, a formula that imposes a negative relationship between b and this flow. And so that gives me a negative feedback relationship. So similarly for F4, um, I won't uh, go into too much detail there, but you could do the same sort of trick with F4. Uh, F4 depends on C and goes into C. And then, uh, so that's almost identical. And then the last one here, the bonus um, is then to write in differential equations for, that represent that system above. So that was purely a bonus. But basically, um, all, every time you see a stock, that turns into, uh, these are, you know you're going to have three variables, uh, and each variable is going to have a net flow equation. So this will be, they'll have a DADT, a DBDT, and a DCDT. And DADT is just going to be its inflow minus its outflow, so F1 minus F4. So I can just go through and write each, for each one of those, DADT, F1 minus F4. Then I can look back up here and I can see uh, DCDT or DBDT is only has F3 going into it. And then finally, DCDT has F4 going into it, but F2 coming out of it. What did I say there? I said. Uh, F4 in and F2 out. And then all of those things are together. I see, I'll be in one second. So did that answer? Yeah. Questions? Um, so prior when you were talking about the number of creating a negative feedback loop consistent with the diagram, oh. how, how do you know what would be is creating a negative feedback loop? Good question. So um, I know that, so the, this, <coughs> Whenever you have these reciprocal relationships, so we're saying here is if I may be uh, bigger, then the inflow, so you can think about each one of these things represents, so these here are inflows into B. And so this is saying that if I made B larger, the inflow is going to shrink because the inflow is going to be like, if B was equal to 1, the inflow would be equal to 1. If B is equal to 100, the inflow would be equal to 1 over 100. So it's, it's right. So that's the negative relationship there. As you make this one bigger, that one gets smaller. All right. Other questions from the study materials? <coughs> Well, if anything, yeah. What's a good chapter to study this whole uh, In the book, so the, the latest chapter that we just read that goes along with the unit D, that's kind of where Moorcroft introduces all the stock and flow diagrams. So that would be a good one to read into. If you would like uh, a little bit more, then I think, um, so I think that's chapter three. Um, if you were to, I think, like we're going to skip chapters four and five, but I think there are some really nice examples in chapter five. You can just kind of skim through and take a look at those examples if you want extra practice. Anything else? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is from the midterm review. Okay, problems. midterm review. Um, it's number seven. Um, I just have a question about the vocabulary for the question. Okay. Um, it says, how do the hiring control, these are the variables, hiring control, departure, <coughs> and saturation loops modulate sales growth over time? What's... Gotcha. Modulate? So let me let me just get that in front of you. You said, which, which one was that? Number seven, that one here? All right, so when I, what I'm asking here is how do hiring control, which is... This loop, departures, and oh no, hiring control, departures, and saturation loops. So uh, departures is just this little loop, and then saturation here modulates sales over time. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, we have uh, sales, which are like widget sales, which are right here. And I'm sort of saying 
that sales growth here, uh, if, it, if all the only loop we had here was sales growth, we were in a magical world where we didn't have to worry about saturation or turnover of salespeople or, uh, or control of hiring, like we had an infinite budget for salespeople and they never left, and there was an infinite market, then sales would just grow unbounded. And so what I'm trying to get here is, uh, is, is the answer that along the lines of that they end up limiting sales. So hiring control departures and saturations are all uh, limiting processes for the growth of sales. So that's what I mean. Modulate just means that it's sort of one process is regulating the another process. And for the test, are you going to, um, well, I don't know if you can tell us that, but go ask questions a lot about the archetypes because that second one, um, 7B, is about behavior over time for the annual revenue. And is that one of the archetypes, behavior over time? Uh, well, so the behavior over time is, so behavior over time shortened BOT is just a diagram of, of what, uh, the, what a trajectory like sales would look like over time. And so, like, if I do time on this axis and sales on this axis, then I was just sort of looking for this S-shaped growth. And the Kim and Lannan one where they went through like those 10 archetypes, I'm not expecting you to memorize those 10 archetypes. In fact, I might give you those 10 archetypes uh, you know, on the, at the front of, uh, of the exam and ask you questions about them. But I do think you should know the six basic ar archetypes which all build on each other that were gone over, I think, in chapter two, or the one or two of the more prompt, which were like basically all related to uh, growth and limitations. So like S-shaped growth was like the big one here. So here, even though you might not remember like all of the like, you know, shifting goals and all of that, what I'm hoping you would see here is that I've got a growth loop here that is being, um, uh, that is connected to a bunch of, so these are a bunch of balancing loops, or I'm sorry, reinforcing loop here connected to a bunch of balancing right here. And so if you see that there's a reinforcing next to a balancing, then you know that this is going to have an S-shaped curve. Can you scroll down a little? Yeah. Please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there is a solution set for these review problems on Canvas that has this drawn on there as well. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many balancing Well, I would say that these archetypes give us a theory for how things are going to work. Now, uh, and so we would kind of guess that for that with a lot of those balancing loops that would kind of act this way because it doesn't look like any of those balancing loops are in conflict with each other. They all are trying to limit the growth loop here. Now, it may be that, that when we simulate this thing, it doesn't quite act this way. And then that then suggests we can really investigate well, what's different from this and normal one. But without simulating it, this gives us kind of an expectation of what we would, you know, what we would expect. And so whenever you have a strong growth loop with a bunch of these limitation loops on top of it, you would expect something that looks roughly like this. Maybe it'll oscillate, but we don't quite know if it's gonna like just be a pure limitation or oscillate or any of that. But at least we have a rough guess of what, we're pretty sure it's not gonna do this. Like we're not gonna have high sales and then have sales plummet. Any other questions about the material you will come up with by just looking over them? So. Okay. so I'll flip back over here. And if anything comes up, just let me know and uh, we can shift that. I'm just going to put these things up here just to get people thinking, but just to make sure get the administrative stuff out of the hands. It's sort of a reminder that we're going to skip four and five, and you're not going to have to worry about chapter six until the end of lecture E4. So lecture E1 will be the Thursday before spring break, and then E2 and E3 are the week after spring break. And so when we're talking about, you know, this is like the week after the week after spring break is when this comes up. But, and all those due dates are already on Canvas. 
Uh, there's a muddiest point um, on canvas, and you can do that as a muddiest point to reflect on the midterm. So the things that you felt like were your strongest, uh, you felt the most confident about in the midterm, the things that were sort of the least familiar to you, that's always useful for me to look back on in crafting these, especially since I'm making this midterm from scratch. Uh, then, I already mentioned this, the midterm of Scantron, look at canvas for practice problems and solutions, as well as that sample midterm. The learning outcomes might be useful in guiding your studying. Um, uh, you, know, come, you can come with one double-sided sheet of hand-produced notes. So I don't want you to photocopy uh, or copy and paste, but if you want to type it, that's fine. If you'd rather type than write. Uh, and um, know the last four digits of your ASU ID. So um, for administrative reasons, I'm not going to have you write your names on the top of the test. It'll just have these last four digits. But, your answers are primarily going to be on the Scantron. We only look at the answers that are on this test if there's a problem with the Scantron. And then we got the retake, which basically will have the test on Thursday, the retake on the upcoming Tuesday, and then lecture E1 on that Thursday and then <coughs> spring break. So that's the timing here. Like I said, similar format and length. So again, any other questions about the format? Yeah. Do we get the Scantron back with no one what we got wrong? What I will do, if they get the answers back to me quickly, and they usually can get them back to me within 24 to 48 hours. So Thursday, I'll basically go straight to the library, drop this off at the library, um, and then hopefully sometime by Friday evening, if we're lucky, I'll get the answers back. And then I put the answers into kind of a spreadsheet and that, um, that strips away all your names. And then I publish that spreadsheet on Canvas, and you can look up your score and what you did, how well you did on each problem uh, by your last four digits. And so I'll post the solution set and that. So that way I don't have to get you the paper copies back, but you'll have a digital version of it. You'll actually be able to see how well everybody did on every question. So you can kind of see the demographics of like, I didn't do well on this question, but most 90% of the other people did. Or I did really well on this question, but 90% of the people didn't do well on the question. So it gives you an idea per question how well you did relative to the class. So that is the goal, is that if they get the solutions back to me quick enough, I will then get you that PDF that has your anonymized scores uh, on every question as well as your total score. And we're going to be able to take the questions with us? Uh, no, you'll turn in all the questions, but then I'll uh, put a solution set. The solution set will go online like right at 5 o'clock or something like this. So you'll immediately be able to see the solution set, and then your answers, um, hopefully you'll see you know, 48 hours after. All right, any other questions about adding and stuff? <clears throat> All right. So like I said, uh, don't forget to go back and study the more abstract stuff from unit one, which is like, what is a model? Um, identifying the kind of qualitative and quantitative models. So not all models are mathematical. Not all models are numerical. Not all models are simulation. Plenty of models are mental models or fashion models or anim animal models uh, and so on and so forth. And so just keep in mind that general definition of a model is something that answers a what if question and this sliding scale between realistic analog models and metaphorical models. So that's all I'm kind of summarizing here. So hopefully if you can look at this slide and justify <laughs> yourself that, to, that everything on here is a model, then you're in good shape. Um, you know, and then the difference between mental models, quantitative models, why they're good, why they're bad, and so on. Uh, and then, you know, why we use simulation models. So all this kind of general stuff, just kind of going through quickly, because uh, it's just kind of want to remind you that all of this material is still there. So any questions over the model stuff? Does everybody understand that, or know what I mean when I say a model helps us answer a what-if question? A model does not need to be mathematical. It does not need to be computational. It doesn't have to have an expression. Uh, it is just anything that helps us answer a what-if question. You know, try to understand gravity by taking a marker and throwing it up in the air and watching on falls produces a model of how gravity works. And so the marker becomes a model, a gravitational model. So, you know, it doesn't have to be something that we write out on a piece of paper. And then unit B, that's when we learned about CLDs. So make sure you can uh, interpret a CLD. Make sure you can draw in missing links to a CLD. Draw in the loops of a CLD. So uh, just as an example here, uh, we've got this stock and flow diagram, which we now know more about. 
And uh, there is uh, the CLD right here, which has less detail than the stock and flow diagram, but it tells us every link has got a polarity, and every loop that's been identified has also got its own kind of polarity. So remember, negative loops are the ones that have an odd number of negative links. If they have an even number of negative links, then they're a positive loop. So be able to spot those. So any questions about the CLDs? Hopefully this view should feel like old hat by now. Uh, so, you know, tricky things is make sure when you're doing these interpretations, you only draw a causal link if there is a direct relationship. So, and uh, when you come up with the sign of that, you have to think about what is the direct relationship of that sign. So even though increasing C might have an effect on other things, which will later on have an effect on the focal variable X. What we're really focused on is in the immediate case, what does increasing C do to X? And that's how I decide on this label here. So I have to hold the other ones constant. And then this is the stuff I was just saying before, is that we count the number of links. If there's an odd number, it's negative. If it's an even number, it's positive. Lots of symbols that we've seen all meaning the same thing. Uh, these are all positive loops, vicious cycles, virtuous cycles. Uh, and then over here, uh, negative loops, balancing loops, counteracting loops. Uh, you might see B, C, or minus. You might see plus or R. Likewise, on the links, you might see S for same. That's the same thing as a plus link. And O for opposite. That's the same thing as a minus. So, um, so any questions about the CLDs? Because we've already done some of the exercises, I won't go through this here, but um, you know, this would be good practice is to try to find the three loops here. Just as a reminder, there's one loop over here, one loop over here, and then there's a giant loop that goes around the outside. And so uh, being able to find all of those loops, it's good practice. Um, find errors in these. These are all the same examples that we did in class earlier. Um, so uh, you can say that, well, you know, this is the wrong loop polarity, and that's not actually a loop, and so this shouldn't even be there. So here's another example of a CLD that doesn't actually have any loops in it. Um, and then causation and correlation. So uh, we know that we have one common cause, and so these things are correlated but you wouldn't want to draw a causal link between them. Just because it is the case that ice cream sales go up and sunburn goes up, you only draw a causal link if you have a mechanism which explains how they're related in that way. And here I have a mechanism. I know how temperature affects ice cream sales, and I know how temperature affects sunburn rate. So this is the right CLD, but that's the wrong CLD because there is no mechanism that links <coughs> ice cream sales and sunburn rate, even though they're correlated. So I might ask you, I might give you one of these and one of these and ask you to eliminate the incorrect causal loop, uh, or the incorrect causal loop diagram, and then you would have to know that, okay, because that's just reflecting correlation, that's the wrong one. That, just that arrow itself is a CLD. Well, I would say that, yeah, this, this is a, the simplest CLD, but and I would probably give you just a tiny little portion of CLD. So this little nugget of CLD is definitely incorrect because there's almost definitely no mechanism we can come up with for this. But this one looks like it's more likely to be correct because we can imagine how <coughs> this could happen or this could happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, the choosing variable names, remember the noun phrases stuff. So I could ask you about good variable names versus bad variable names. So variables should be noun phrases, variables should have a clear sense of direction, and the normal sense of direction should be positive. And so we gave kind of examples of that. And so, uh, you know, you don't want to say costs rise, you just want to say costs. You, rather than saying feedback from boss, you'd like to be specific and say praise. Rather than saying, uh, costs and losses, where losses is over here, it might be easier to say profits and then make it a negative link instead. And that's what we're trying to show here. So the naming stuff there. So and then we just sort of said imply measurability. So are there any questions about the naming stuff, correlation, causation, all this review of how we draw CLDs? Uh, so this is just more cross saying the same sort of things. Um, and then being able to go from a simple description of a system 
to modeling its causal loops or causal links here. And so we know that, uh, that there is a relationship between the water level and the flow rate by way of the control policy implemented by the human. The human sees where the water level is, that the water level gets higher and higher, the flow rate gets lower and lower. And so being able to take water level flow of water and put them in this diagram where you put water level in one place, flow another place, put the loop uh, link, uh, polarities correctly, and then put the correct polarity in the middle here, be, be able to do something like that. So any questions about that, how to link from these two variables, water and flow, to this variable here, which now look more and more like that toilet example that we've seen so far. Okay. Um, you know, again, I might give you something like this and ask you to label them. So, you know, this is, we know how births and population are related. We know how population might be related to food supply and likewise food supply to these. So could we do all those labels? other sorts of exercises you might like, or that might be asked to do. I don't know if you like them. And then, uh, the, you know, this is like that homework problem, so being able to label all the links and loops. I uh, may not give you the VHS and, and beta uh, example uh, because it's a little esoteric, but you can imagine I could give you um, a loop that is, or a set of loops that do not have certain labels where, to me, I'm pretty sure that you'll understand how the these individual links work, and then you'll have the, the label them. So that's the only goal there. So any questions about CLDs? Yeah. Right, well, I, I guess uh, what I'm saying is that, that um, lately when I teach this class, I've been using this example because it's a nice canned example I got out of a textbook, and I like the way it looks. These kind of kidney shapes here. But in the first time I, I used it, and didn't have any problem. But since then, I spent to spend a lot of time explaining what beta and VHS are. And so a lot of times, people have a hard time sort of seeing how these things individually work. And so it, 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 it's, it's turned into something that requires like domain knowledge and VCRs. And it never was intended that way. So if I were to rewrite it, maybe I'd figure out a way to do like Android and iPhone. But in some ways, I like this because betas um, ended up kind of getting totally beat out. And that's sort of what this ar archetype suggests, is whoever gets uh, started will end up beating out even another one, even if it's a little bit better. So, um, so that's all I mean is it, it may not be as relatable, but I will try to come up with examples that I think are relatable that you'll be able to draw these diagrams for. So on an, as an example, I think on the midterm B, I might have had a question about um, I don't know, palm walk or something like that, and ask you to draw a causal loop diagram related to palm walk. So hopefully that's, you know, relatable. So, questions about CLDs? Go ahead. The question I think on the midterm review was about uh, relating to how much enforcement you put on palm walk for walk only zones. And so what is the relationship between the number of people uh, violating the walk-only zones and the number of enforcement you put in. How do you deal with a, a negative feedback loop related to that? Okay. So then we got into archetypes. And so like I said, you don't have to memorize all of those archetypes from that Kim and Landon paper. Um, I would probably give you some of those and ask you questions about them. So be able to interpret them and be able to know the different ways that these archetypes are used. And so um, you know, we, we talked about how getting toward archetypes was in Moorcroft, this event-oriented worldview. Remember, the event-oriented worldview is a worldview without feedback. It's a worldview where you have a problem, and you come up with an action, and you don't think about the closed loop of how the action might create more problems in the future. And so, you know, understand the difference between event-oriented and feedback systems. And so the feedback systems is where we actually model how our actions themselves can feedback back onto the situation, potentially creating more problems later. So the difference between event-oriented and feedback systems, those are good terms to know and keep in mind. Um, you know, these are the archetypes you probably should have, like balancing with delay can create all of these different behaviors over time, depending on how big the delay is. Uh, oscillation is uh, one of those examples of balancing with delay. 
So um, that's our balancing with delay there. The other archetype you should probably know is S-shaped growth. So know that if you have a balancing and a reinforcing next to each other, where the reinforcing is kind of at, at low levels of the state variables, you get all reinforcing, and then the high levels, it gets limited by the balancing, then you know that one. And then combine those together, S growth with overshoot, where I've got my reinforcing loop on my balancing loop, but the delay in there means that I'm going to grow to a point and then oscillate. And that was effectively in, um, in that Forrester model for the global dynamics, limits to global growth, that was sort of what he was showing is depending on the delays in the global system he built, you could either get massive collapses, which are kind of like these oscillations, or things would settle out. And so the amount of delay depends on, you know, whether you're going to settle out or whether you're just going to get these oscillations that are possibly really bad. So those are the, you know, if you know growth with overshoot, you probably know all the rest because this kind of combines them all together. And then we got into the more complicated uh, ones, and those are the ones I would probably give you, but you should know these four ways to use these archetypes. There's lenses, structural pattern templates, tools for predicted paper, and, and uh, behavior and dynamic theories. And so we said we can use these models as lenses, so it's good to kind of remember what that meant by lenses. We can also use them as pattern templates where it allows us to view diagrams as patterns of loops as opposed to single variables. But then we could also use them as dynamic theories. So they explain why things might be happening in a system that we observe. And then this is kind of the, you know, understanding what currently is. And then the last one, tools for predicting behavior, is if we assume that the future is determined only by what's going on in the current system, we can say what are the possible trajectories that can come out of that. And so we could get growth. Um, that is sort of forever, but that's probably too optimistic. And so most likely our real prediction is going to have limits. And there's going to be a balancing loop outside here. So those are the four different ways you can kind of use these archetypes to help us come up with uh, ways to manage a system and come up with interventions. So that was like the last chapter, last unit before we got to the real stock and flow diagrams. So we're still kind of in the abstract section. Um, so any questions about that before we just kind of remind everybody about stock and flow diagrams, which should be the most recent stuff. Are you going to be asking us about like, the definitions of stuff, like endogenous perspective and the archetypes? I would say know what I mean by endogenous perspective. It is like it would be fair for me to use endogenous perspective in a question in some way. So that idea, that's like fundamental to this type of modeling is that we are assuming that dynamic properties of a system uh, are sort of internal to the system, that, that we are not worried for this, this part about how the how external drivers could change the system. We're saying how could the system behave if it was just the system by itself, and that's the endogenous perspective. So I would definitely know that word. I wouldn't necessarily say what's the definition of it, but I definitely might use it. So then unit D, the last unit that the midterm goes over, which is basically about the stock and flow diagrams and numerical simulation. So we started with the Excel spreadsheets, and that was just a way to kind of get our heads around what's going on behind the scenes in the stock and flow diagrams. So I uh, used this compound interest formula here, um, and basically was able to take a model of what goes on in the bank and turn it into a causal loop diagram and suggests that we are going to use this as a conceptual framework to build a numerical tool for us to investigate any dynamical system. We just need a way to define the state variables in the dynamical system, which are like the balance in the bank, and what causes those state variables to change over time, which is like the interest. And so that idea that I'm trying to build a banking model of any system that changes over time so this was our, our banking trajectory. We could watch how dollars grow over time, and we can turn bacteria into that. And so this kind of goes to that modeling question. How do I model something as a bank account when you've got these discrete events that happen at random times? Well, the first thing you do is you just say, well, I'm going to assume it's a smooth flow where at the end of a particular time, I will get <coughs> the accumulation of one of those events. But it's like the events partially happen all the way up into that point. So that's why every bacteria adds a little bit of bacteria at every instant of time. 
And so I can multiply the total, the number of bacteria by that rate, and then that tells me how many new bacteria I get in the next generation, and so on and so forth. And so I, I say generation, but I don't mean bacterial generation, I mean in this little DT time step. So we're cutting up time into small portions where we can assume that whatever is happening in one, uh, in one tiny portion might be adding to the stocks, but we're not going to actually model the effect of that until the next portion. So this unit just tells me how the stock is going to change from one step to another. And the claim is that any dynamic variable you've got, uh, that anything that changes over time, that variable that's changing could be modeled as a stock. And the thing that is making it change could be modeled as a flow. So long as you can write an expression for the flow, the derivative, you can then put it into this framework inside a spreadsheet or whatever and get an approximation of what's going to happen to that system over time. And that's what we were doing. That's what we started to do with this spreadsheet. So we've got all these formulas that describe bacterial growth in a spreadsheet that we end up translating to something that we could implement in BIMSA. And so, um, and so this is kind of the way it works in Vincent. It's like anything I can describe as a stock, then I can, if I can write an expression for how that stock changes from one time instant to another, then I put that expression inside the flow, and I hit go on Vincent after setting an initial stop, and then Vincent will end up generating a trajectory which will be identical to what I would get if I solved this calculus integration problem. That's what's going on in substance. And there's the bacterial example of that. So we've gone from a spreadsheet to VinSim, all as an alternative to dealing with this in, uh, in formal way, or with formal methods. Um, so uh, this, you know, more, this we left off with, uh, you know, Moorcroft's kind of examples of stocks and flows where uh, there were coordinating networks. And the important thing here is that all the links tell you what you're allowed to use inside the thing that the links are going to. So inside A, I can use a formula that uses B and C because those are the ones wired up to it. Sectors, that was a nice term that Moorcroft introduced as chunks of a giant stock and flow diagram that allow us to work on one portion of the model at a time. So I would know the term sector map, I would know the term <coughs> sectors, um, and be able to talk about models in terms of their sectors be able to kind of follow this diagram through to understand that these four sectors are connected by the common variables that show up in each one of them. So this is actually one big stock and flow diagram, but it's been broken down into four little stock and flow diagrams that communicate with each other. So any questions on the stock and flow development? So the rest of this is just a few practice problems. I think I actually have a video online and actually the solutions to these already on Canvas, um, maybe. Uh, but just as, you know, as examples, we don't have to do them here, but this is, you know, I could give you, this is a diagram which uh, is actually represents the processes that go on when you get a cut. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, a, a nice challenge would be to say, can you label all the links? And so a lot of these terms you might not know, but most of them, my claim is that this, even though it's a complicated system, if you focus on a single link at a time, you can kind of guess what the polarity might be. So as the size of a clot increases, the amount of this thrombin, which is like the thing that plugs up the clot, you imagine would decrease. You know, so this, you can imagine this thing here is going to end up reducing as the clot gets bigger and the cut gets uh, plugged up then you need less stuff to plug it up. And so you could kind of go around here and figure out different pluses and minuses to put on this diagram. I wouldn't probably put, give you something that was so physiological on the midterm, but again, I'm just trying to give you an example that kind of stretches it where you could imagine I gave you something that you could relate to, like palm walk, and be able to put in the pluses and minuses on each of the links, and then be able to label each of the loops. So here's the answer to that. So with all those pluses and minuses, and there's my, uh, my loops that I can see. I've got a reinforcing loop and a balancing loop next to each other, and that kind of relates to how uh, a cut ends up getting a scab over it and then stopping the, the, the bleeding. So it's an example of that. 
If I show you simulation outputs for different values of dt, hopefully you can tell me what is the right dt to pick. So here's examples here where I've said here's a simulation, let's say of bacterial growth, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, here I've got a large value of dt of 0.1, and it gets smaller and smaller as you go to the right, and then as you go down to the right. And so as we see that the, the, this value here is the value where if you get any smaller, the graph doesn't really change. And so you could make it smaller and smaller and smaller, but you're just going to make the simulation take longer to execute. And so this is kind of the optimal value of dt because the results stop changing. Whereas if you look up here, as you get the dt smaller and smaller, the results do sort of change. It's like it, it's at like around 300, and then it jumps up to closer to 350, closer to 400, and then it kind of stays there for the rest of the decreases here. So be able to choose a, a dt intelligently. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful because there could be unit. Uh, so if you look at the scaling on these axes, like here, this goes to 400, that goes to 450, that goes to 450, this goes to 350. Uh, and so you have to be careful when evaluating these things because you look at these and from afar, they might look like, you know, these might all look very similar. Like these two might look similar to each other until you realize this stops at 350, whereas this goes all the way to 400. And so be careful when you're looking at these plots because the scaling, and I could possibly throw that in there because you do see in Vincent or in Excel, it auto scales. And so sometimes when you're checking for these DTs, if you don't check for the scale, you can make a bad choice. You might think your DT is small enough, when in reality, if you didn't look at the scale, um, once you look at the scale, you see that actually this plot is very different than this plot, even though they might look like they're the same without the scale. Yeah. Have we had a situation in any assignments yet where we've had to use a DT in the uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I kind of leave that left it up to, to you to pick. But if you would have changed those like bacterial growth rates to make them very small, you would also have to move that DT smaller. So as you make the time scale of the system faster and faster and faster, the DT will have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Which one's the right graph? Um, on here, uh, well, so these I think are all the same graphs as before. But my point was here is that. Uh, that like this looks like a different graph than this, but these are actually the same graph, but this scaling has to go to 450 and this only goes to 400. So you just have to make sure you look at the scale before you make that choice. Yeah. So just for clarification, the largest DT value without change of the ones that are there. That's right. Is the most correct. Right. I would like a large DT value because it's faster, but I have to make it small to make it accurate. So it's those two things can play. I think the only other things I've got on here, um, so this is another kind of fun example. I won't go into any detail, but you can find this online. But you could, if I gave you a stock and flow diagram, a kind of higher order thinking question <coughs> might be at what time was the high the first? And the answer here basically is the instant where the inflow matches the outflow is the time where the net flow goes from positive to minus to negative. So at this point, you only have bees entering the hive. At this point, you only have bees exiting the hive. So because they've only been sort of entering, it's been the dominant process, it's the fullest at this point here. And that is equivalent to back in calculus, finding where the derivative is equal to zero. So, um, so that's kind of a, a higher order question that uh, might be useful to look at. Um, I might give you stock and flow diagrams like this and ask you to try to guess the formulas. Uh, we've done a little bit of that already in some of the example problems. So that is online as well. And, um, and then draw causal loop diagrams based on formulas. We've already done examples of that um, earlier today. So here's just more examples of that. And then here's, I think, examples of, and again, we've already did a question like this already today. All right, so I think that is about it. So we're about out of time. So if you have any other questions, you can see me uh, after class or office hours or send me an email. Um, just do the same reminders as before. Um, so midterm coming up. And uh, then I'll do the attendance exercise here. And so for this attendance exercise, um, give me your simplest definition of what the endogenous perspective is. <laughs> so in as few words as you can, tell me what it means to take an endogenous perspective in your model.
No, I'll, I'll have the Scantron sheets. And I will also bring scrap paper, although I don't think you'll need it. And if you need a calculator, you can bring one. Just make sure it doesn't like have any PDFs loaded on it or anything like that. Hmm? How do you put PDFs on there? There are new versions, uh, I forget what the model is, that, that that is one of the features, is they store notes on them. 